There are three events in UFO history that have made this motion picture possible. In the 1950s, Trevor James Constable unlocks one of the mysteries of UFOs. With the aid of infrared photography, he discovers the fact that some UFOs are invisible. By using infrared film in his cameras, he discovered UFOs that exist in a light spectrum that cannot be seen with the naked eye or photographed with conventional cameras. This opens a whole new aspect in the documenting of UFOs, and his discovery reveals some UFOs may be living creatures. He calls them critters. In 1994, his ASMU discovers a phenomenon called rods, a life form invisible to the naked eye that we've never seen before. He also develops a technique for filming these life forms that exist in the realm of the very fast. He calls it skyfish, using high-speed shutter settings on camera. In 1995, NASA stops airing live broadcasts from shuttle missions after UFO footage has been made public, creating a controversy about how much NASA really knows about their existence. Looks like you got an object right in front of you, Mark. Can you look out there? I'm not sure what you're talking about. Never mind. That same year, Martin Stubbs begins recording what will be five years and over 2,500 hours of uninterrupted live broadcasts from NASA's own download. Today, we have digital camcorder technology that enables us to capture UFOs in full-color, high-resolution video. Invisible UFOs can now be captured in broad daylight by anyone. Two camcorders of the same make and model are set up side by side. Camera 1 on the left is set for regular daytime recording. Camera 2 on the right is set on night shot, which has been converted to shoot in broad daylight. On the regular camera, there's nothing in the sky. With the night shot camera on the right, a UFO that is in the infrared spectrum is clearly visible. What has never been seen that exists in the invisible realm of the infrared can now be seen using current camcorder technology. Using this new technology for filming UFOs invisible to the naked eye, someone out there will eventually capture the best UFO or rod footage ever, and probably in high definition video. UFO research, however, is only a part of the story. I think it's long past time to open this up to the public. Give us information to the young people of the world in this country. They want to hear it. They want it. Give it to them. Don't hide it and tell lies and make stories. They're not stupid. Eventually, there's going to be something happen that uh, it will make all of them have egg all over their place. And they're going to have to admit that they, you know, they haven't been truthful at all.
of L.A. was the first time that our military actually fired upon a UFO. The next day, the military told the press it was nothing but a weather balloon. Another report was that they fired at nothing due to war nerves. The Army was not too pleased with these reports. If they could not bring down a weather balloon with almost 1,500 rounds fired and direct hits, then what would they be able to do firing at real enemy targets? This was the first time official denial was put into motion regarding UFOs. This was 1942, only a few months after Pearl Harbor. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Dr. Willie Lay. Well, now, is our hmm. own government, our own Defense Department, taking the uh, flying saucer report seriously? They have to. After all, the Air Force, which is the one which is investigating, is charged with the defense of our time. So if there's anything in the skies which they don't know and cannot account for, it makes them understandably uneasy. Major Donald E. Kehoe, a retired Marine Corps officer, insisted that the Air Force knew more than it was telling. We are being observed by some type of device which is ahead of us, far ahead of us, and is probably controlled by a highly advanced superior civilization. It has reached the point where Many people in the Air Force have the same conclusion. In fact, the Air Force at one time had a top secret estimate that these things were interplanetary spaceships. Right now, if you report having seen a flying saucer, you open yourself up to ridicule, too, which is something that is deplored by the Air Force. Uh, in other words, members of our audience who might, for one reason or another, see a flying saucer can make the reports to the Air Force and be rendering a service now yes. and not invite ridicule. Yeah. Instead of being a... Uh, subject for ridicule and a big joke actually is a serious matter which could affect the lives of all of us. Actually, most people who report a UFO sighting are patriotic citizens who have been mystified by something that they've seen and through a patriotic sense reported to the local law enforcement officials or to the United States Air Force Base near them. The first reports were brought in by quiet and sober citizens, like Frank Manor. I looked to the north of me, and uh, there looked like a foreign star. The uh, yeah, air was wet and kind of coming down, and on a 40, about a 45. And so then I watched it, and I was going to see if it landed, and then maybe go down and see what it was. And uh, when it got to the top of the trees, it stopped, and a, a blue and a white light come on. And uh, I looked at it, and I thought I was seeing things. Frank Manor's UFO remained over his swamp for more than four hours. His children saw it. His in-laws saw it. Residents of the area saw it. I saw it looked to be shaped like a pie. I could see the front of it. I just saw the round front, and I could see the light on either side. I just wanted to stay there and keep my eyes glued to it. I couldn't wait. But I can't fathom it because it seems so unreal. William Van Horn. Hillsdale's undertaker and civil defense director also spotted the UFO and was with his Geiger counter the next day, checking a mysterious perfect circle where the UFO had been seen. No one photographed it, but Sergeant Newell Schneider of the Sheriff's Office remembered it well enough to draw it. Oh, it uh, moved very rapidly at any speed or rather any direction it wanted to go. Why it could change and go to the right or the left or go crossways uh, without hesitating a bit. What do you think of it? Well, if they call it a flying saucer, that's what it is. 
the Air Force sent its chief scientific consultant on UFOs, Professor J. Allen Hynek, to check the Michigan sightings. Dr. Hynek agreed that the good citizens of Michigan had seen something in the marshlands. He thought they had seen marsh gas. They, as children on the farm, had, had many experiences with swamp light, and that this was obviously the thing that it was, and they couldn't understand why the people in Michigan got so excited over swamp light. Dr. Hynek's belief in marsh gases was not exactly welcomed by Ann Arbor Sheriff Douglas Harvey, who had some interesting things to tell me. Because if he's going to say it's marsh gases, I'll, I'll tell you now, in all due respect to Professor Hynek, uh, he's all wet. I think this is a flowered up field because last night he was in uh, in my office, and this is what my statement will contain, and at 11 o'clock he had no statement whatsoever to make. He told me he had no idea what it was, but he said the Pentagon said that he had to make a statement tomorrow. He said, I don't know what I'm going to say. I see. So overnight he comes up with this theory. Right now, if you report having seen a flying saucer, you open yourself up to ridicule. Well, you're going to be here with beer bottles thrown. Look at my windshield. What would you think if somebody was throwing beer bottles at your house, standing out in the middle of the road screaming, uh, you nut, you fanatic, and all that? What would you think? You open yourself up to ridicule. Are you sorry now that you did tell people what you saw? Yes, I am. I am, I am sorry because uh, it, it, it's, not the, 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 it's not the truth, but it's just the idea that the reaction of the people. They think you're a nut. Tell you the truth, that's just what they figure you are. And I'm not going to take it from why I don't want nobody down in here. I, I just leave me alone. You open yourself up to ridicule too, which is something which is deployed by the Air Force, is deployed by the Air Force, is deployed by the Air Force. And if, and if the thing lands right there, right there by that pump, I'd never say a word. And he got out and talked to me, I wouldn't tell nobody. That's just the way I feel. I'm bitter and, and disgusted in the whole matter. According to the United States Air Force, in following a policy which is set probably fairly high in the Pentagon, there are about 250 or 300 extremely incompetent airline and military pilots in this country. The airlines let them continue to fly even though they have reported UFOs. The Air Force has been accused from time to time of hiding information about UFO. What do you have to say to that kind of thing? Well, these charges are absolutely untrue. We have not been hiding anything. This is not an attack on the Air Force spokesman or the project spokesman. They are simply following orders to explain away all UFO sightings as quickly as possible when they become public and deny that UFOs really exist. UFOs were fairly new, and even though there had been sporadic reports throughout the late 1800s and early 1900s, they were simply nothing to worry about. Flying saucers had been reported and photographed worldwide. They were not an issue because the sightings, although seen by pilots and close to army bases, did not seem to pose any kind of threat. They were simply passed off as strange lights or sightings of atmospheric and weather anomalies by untrained civilians who were seeing things that were easy to explain. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, it became apparent that our military needed to control who or what flew into our airspace. Radar was the newest technology for detecting anything in our skies that was not acknowledged to be our aircraft. The Battle of L.A. was an example of an unknown aircraft that was immune to all that our anti-aircraft guns could deliver. Nothing could bring this one object down. What was our military going to do to control this unknown threat? What would happen if the public found out these things were real and there was nothing we could do to stop them? The only solution was to deny that there was any kind of threat from something we had no control over, something we could not stop. The solution included an official denial that would last over 60 years. The Air Force and the CIA hired and commissioned the top astronomers, scientists, and experts of those times to become the authorities on the subject of UFOs. These experts appeared on national radio and television and gave the naive, gullible, and patriotic public the myth about UFOs. Astronomer Thornton Page was on a CIA committee that investigated UFO reports in 1952. Its conclusion? No evidence of UFOs. Even highly regarded astronomer Carl Sagan was placed by the Air Force as a consultant on a scientific panel to deny the existence of UFOs. The official Air Force reply was that there was no cover-up and there were no flying saucers from outer space. I would like to close by reading a very brief excerpt on the report of the Air Force's scientific advisory board, which they made 
recently at my meeting a detailed review of the subject of UFO. This is a statement. The committee concluded that in the 19 years since the first UFO was sighted, there has been no evidence that unidentified flying objects are a threat to our national security. This was to become the greatest story ever denied. Los Angeles, my brother and I were devastated by the Northridge earthquake. I was awake that morning making final edit decisions on a film that we had been working on for the past year. Our film and video editing studio was destroyed, so we had to finish cutting the film at one of the labs in Burbank. We didn't realize that the earthquake was only the beginning of what would become one of the many life-changing events that were about to unfold. We decided to go home and visit our family for a while before coming back and starting all over again. We went back to Roswell, New Mexico, which is our hometown, and a couple of months later we filmed the first broad daylight footage ever taken of UFOs over the Roswell area. We compiled an enormous archive of broad daylight UFO activity at Midway, which is where we all grew up, and which is located just nine miles south of Roswell. Midway is also the place where the Rods phenomenon was discovered. A mysterious object has been caught on tape over Albany, New York. It, it looks suspiciously like a missile. Is that possible? Yeah, and that's pretty scary over a commercial airport, but uh, I don't know. Whatever it is, it was going very fast. It was above the clouds, and it was hundreds of feet in length. So the FBI has seen this tape? Yeah, they, they took it from me, and uh, it's on its way to Washington to be analyzed. Now, what do you think it is? I mean, just looking at it, are you you calling it a UFO? Or are you calling it uh, a missile? What, what does it look like to you? The, a lot of people are saying that it's it's this thing called a rod, which I'm not sure about. Um, these biological creatures that live in the upper atmosphere, which sounds strange, that we haven't uh, discovered yet because they're they just move too fast for us to see. It doesn't so, so some somebody's telling you that thing is an animal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, this. This guy, Jose Escamilla, he's been researching these for like eight years. He has a website, and that's what he thinks. It's amazing. No telling what these things are going to teach us once we catch a specimen and uh, investigate what its makeup is. But it's an incredible phenomenon. Whatever these things are, they've mastered the ability to travel through both mediums as if there's nothing really there. It's just like traveling through dimensions. The rods are just a, one part of an enormous panorama of life that is veiled from normal human sight. You found that by using an extremely fast shutter, you could slow down and objectify something that would otherwise elude the photographic process. But that doesn't mean that they're not there. It just means that you need a device, an apparatus that will remove an optical limitation that you have. Uh, we don't reject the microscope because the microscope intensifies the power of human sight. Without it, the world of the microbe would not exist. But that wouldn't alter the fact that our entire environment, our entire living scenario, is really conditioned upon what happens in a, in a domain that we cannot see directly. In my opinion, the same thing applies, and this will be verified in years to come, at the upper border of nature. But I realized at this point that it's very secret, that it was kept secret, because I asked him, what are you going to do with this piece of information? And he said, we always airbrush these out before we sell them to the public. So they're pesky little creatures uh, appearing on this uh, photograph they wanted to get rid of. This is a fact of the matter. We were really not sure after John flew whether or not there were critters, living critters, out there somewhere. Critters that were captured by NASA on that mission, the STS-75, in 1996. In all my considerable experience of the entire UFO scenario, I have never seen and never expected to see footage like that. And least of all did I expect to see it on film that, or, or tape that had been exposed by the government in a NASA mission. The shuttle Columbia in this mission 
was equipped with a very sophisticated and expensive ultraviolet camera. It was sensitive to the near ultraviolet. And when they were up at 300 miles above the atmosphere, they launched from the Columbia a small satellite with a tether. Not long after it was launched from the Columbia, the tether broke. We record steadily the whole uh, break and uh, coil back to the tether. Copy, Claude. Here we go. Again, this is a view of the satellite. Well, if it had to break, it, it did it in the right place. And you see on this astonishing film, you see the uh, satellite go drifting far astern of this orbiting Columbia. The tether, which is 12 miles long, straightens out into a long white line, which you can see as plainly as, as could be. Columbia and the satellite now 77 nautical miles apart. Now, while this is all going on, a whole covey of UFOs, perhaps three dozen of them, manifest to this ultraviolet camera, and they begin moving around, circulating, looking for all the world like something in an aquarium tank. The satellite, again, uh, just moving into sunrise. Now, Houston, of course, down on the ground, is getting this feed from from the Columbia, and they ask the astronauts in the shuttle, what can they see? What is it they, what is it they can see? You guys getting the image? Franklin, uh, we see a long line, a couple of star-like things, and a lot of things swimming in the foreground. Can you describe what you're seeing? Well, the long line is, uh, is a tether, um, and uh, there's a little bit of debris that uh, kind of flies with us. It is like a brilliant white bar. It looks like a neon sign, and it's 12 miles long. Now, what this does is give you a sort of cosmic ruler by which you can get an idea and an estimate of the diameter of the UFOs that are flitting around down there. Now, when you see them go behind the tether, that means that you can use that tether like a ruler to measure their diameter. And those things that are down there going behind the tether are between two and three nautical miles in diameter. One of the things you see over and over again is you see UFOs materialize into the ultraviolet while you watch. You see them come from out of nowhere to the point where they are returning a response to the camera. You also see them dematerialize while you, while you have them under observation. There's two of the central things that have gone on with UFOs since day one, materialization and dematerialization. It's going on in this film, 300 miles above the Earth, photographed by your government with your astronauts superintending the whole thing. Columbia Houston, that's a much better view, uh, a lot more contrast visible. It's not an infrequent occurrence out there. They have quite often. There were probably 1,500 reported cases in there. Uh, I have uh, over 3,000 cases now. They estimated 100 yards from the left wing with this 100 foot disc and the strength of the signal was as strong as the surface contact on the water of an aircraft carrier. This, this contact was...
We are here today to disclose the truth about a subject that has been ridiculed and questioned, denied for at least 50 years. The reason we are coming forward now is that we are asking for the U.S. Congress and for President Bush to move towards an official inquiry and disclosure on this subject. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Clifford Stone. I'm a Sergeant First Class, United States Army. My name is Dwayne Arneson. I served 26 years as a communication electronics officer in the U.S. Air Force. My name is John Callahan. I'm a retired FAA employee. I was the division manager for the Accidents Evaluation and Investigation Division. My name is Don Phillips. I was in the United States Air Force and uh, had worked with certain intelligence agencies of the United States government. These are people who have been inside the CIA, NSA, NRO, Air Force, Navy, Marines, Army, all divisions of the intelligence and military community, as well as corporate witnesses, contractors to the government. My name is Dan Willis. My name is uh, George Filer. The third. My name is John Maynard. My name is Donna Hare. My name is Carl Wolf. My name is Harlan Bentley. My name is Larry Warren. My name is Mark McCandlish. And these are folks who have been involved in so-called black budget or covert unacknowledged projects. These unacknowledged special access projects are taking in at least 40 to 80 billion dollars per year. And they are sitting on technologies that can change the world forever. My name is Charles L. Brown. My name is Michael Smith. My name is Robert Solis. My name is Carol Rosen. I have had grown men, men weep. Who are in the Pentagon? Who are members of Congress? And who have said to me, what are we going to do? And I'm prepared to tell the story in front of Congress. And uh, it is the truth. And I will testify under oath before Congress that what I'm saying is the truth. I'm prepared to go to Congress, to swear before Congress that everything I've told you people and everything that is here is the truth. These men and women have come forward and they have their credentials, they can establish who they are, and they have been first-hand witnesses to some of the most important events in the history of the human race. I'm willing to testify to the truth of all these matters that I've spoken about in front of Congress under oath. I'm willing to testify before Congress that what I'm saying is true. And I am prepared to uh, testify in detail concerning these events and their truthfulness before Congress. These statements are true. I'm willing to testify under oath before Congress. That I will testify under oath as to what I say is true. And I will do so before Congress. So I will testify before Congress if necessary and explain exactly what happened. And I will testify before the Congress under oath about everything I have said and more. I have personally briefed a sitting director of Central Intelligence, James Woolsey, President Clinton's first CIA director. I have personally briefed the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, the head of intelligence joint staff, members of the Senate Intelligence Committee, many members of Congress, members of the European leadership, the Japanese cabinet and others. And what I have found is that none of them are surprised that this is true, but they are uniformly horrified that they have not had access to these projects. A lot of people talk about conspiracies over a shadow government. I'm willing to testify before...
Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. The whole project was uh, get as much information and technology out of these crafts as fast as they could and to uh, steer the news media off on some crazy idea that uh, these sightings were uh, created by uh, college pranks and balloons and uh, meteorological uh, problems. And uh, a lot of the information was siphoned off by the CIA and the National Security Agency and uh, people at ONI, Office of Naval Intelligence. It was the first time I'd ever seen anything like this before, and, and all eyes uh, were, were just peeled on that particular thing. And when he told us what it was, it, uh, uh, it was frightening. It was eerie there. You could have heard a pin drop in the room when, when it was first mentioned. Well, he said it would, had been taken from one of the craft that had uh, crashed in, uh, in New Mexico and that it had been taken from a box of materials that the military was working on. Uh, they didn't use the word uh, reverse engineering at that time, but the, it was some, something similar to the reverse engineering uh, that they felt like uh, uh, they, uh, they needed to work on and it was going to take years to do this. I was a duty officer that night, and I went to the veterinarian section, and one of a sergeant I knew very well was sergeant of the guard that night. I told him, Sarge, how's everything around here? And he said, fine, sir. I told him, you know, they told me to be careful to watch this area because you have a sense of something sensitive here. He said, you want to see it, sir? I told him, yes, let's go look. And I knew the sergeant, he was a master sergeant. I went back, and he, there was five crates there, like five or six, I think it was five. I lifted one up, and here's this body there in floating in fluid. First, I thought it was a, a child, because it was small. Then I looked at this head and all, right away, and this was only happened a matter of seconds. Then I put the end back down, and uh, the head was different, the arms were spindly, the body it was gray. So right at that moment, I, I figured, uh, I don't know what this thing is, so like an intelligence business, I just better put it in the back of my head here and wait to maybe in the future I get cooperation so I can evaluate what it is. Curtis LeMay started to open up and talk about uh, what he told me about Roswell and uh, uh, the crash that had occurred and uh, he told me that he was aware that it, that it wasn't ours, it wasn't the military's, uh, the Air Force or the Army or the Navy and that was highly uh, strange, was a highly strange vehicle that crashed. He said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, but if you say that I told you, I swear I never even mentioned it to you. I said, no problem. And he said to me, you know I'm a member of General Douglas MacArthur's security guard. He says, I'm on my way to the States for TDY. He said, I'm going to tell you something. General Douglas MacArthur was very familiar with the Roswell incident, the crash material, and also the bodies, because he himself has seen them. There I start getting the tosser reports. I start getting other crash reports, the artifacts I got. And I did get one time a report that NSA was getting signals from space, which were not just space noise or, uh, you know, or unscrambled or something you couldn't read. They were, they were really very perfect and looked like something was guiding them. There was a real message. We were never able to decode it. This was a, a, a very coordinated message. It wasn't just noise coming. It was a pattern. The one person I happened to meet and took quite a shine to, and, and he to me, was a, a Dr. Adolf Rome. Just a little background on him. He was from Switzerland originally. He was on their first A-bomb test in the U.S. He knew Dr. Oppenheimer personally, and uh, just a, a fine, fine gentleman. Um, one night after, after supper and after a few martinis, I jokingly asked Adolf, I said, uh, what do you know about the little gray men that are supposedly on ice here at Wright-Patterson? And I can distinctly recall his face turning ashen white. His voice got very stern, and he said, Arnie, he says, all I can tell you is that they were not with the balloons, 
and we will not talk about it again. You understand? And uh, there was no uncertainty in my mind that uh, <clears throat> we wouldn't talk about this further. We can safely say that, yes, there were some captured craft uh, in Roswell, New Mexico, and, yeah, they were real. And, yes, we really did get some technology from them. And, yes, we really did put it to work. How many bodies had been recovered? Don't know. Uh, how many crashes have occurred in which we only got debris from because they came and did their recovery before we got there? Don't know, but it, it has happened. It has happened. When they have problems, just like we send out a distress call, they send out a distress call, which is something that a lot of people don't allude to or don't even... It's the one question that's never asked. But here again, we think of them as something intangible, like that stuffed animal there. But they're living, breathing creatures, as mortal as you and I. They think, they have loves, they have likes, they have dislikes, they have social culture. This is so, so important to try to make people understand that that is the case. There were more crashes than Roswell, but people don't understand is that uh, there was one in 1948 and there was another one in 1949. The radar testing in uh, New Mexico was the cause of a lot of them that were crashing and uh, high-powered transmitters. When they would get too close to uh, transmitters, uh, they would, it would interfere with their guidance control and they would just crash. And other craft crashed. Uh, we had shot them down. As an example of some of our precision, we have here a photo of an object re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, through our programs, we were able to predict a precise time that this was going to happen and notified a, a particular agency who then went out with a camera and was able to obtain this photograph. What altitude? Uh, this is just entering the Earth's atmosphere somewhere around 400,000 feet. We've been successful. We crashed in White Sands, New Mexico. We tracked it. We were tracking it at the time, and we were successful in damaging it enough where it crashed. Uh, I can verify, uh, corroborated uh, by the people that I have worked with and do work with now. I had a comment that was really funny at that particular point. I didn't really connect it with anything until later. He says, you have no idea at all what we're about, do you? And I told him, no, sir, I don't. And he says, well, someday the technology will be out there that has been totally back-engineered. Went right over my head at that particular point. When we gave the information out, we gave it out and, and, and insisted they take the patents. But also we put a little bit of a requirement on that requirement, feed it back to us for the competitive edge of the Army. Take the patents, make all the money you want, but give it to the American people and give it to the world. If you, the Japanese, they interviewed me, and I told them when we put the integrated circuit out, we also gave it to you. <laughs> Also had fiber optics laying there. They didn't know what these things were. They figured they were wires of some sort, but didn't know how they operate. The interesting thing that shows you that we have not achieved the point of where these fiber optics are is my dad would also hold them in his hand, and when he closed his hand around them, the ends would be glowing. So this means they contain their own energy. Hey, well, why would you need a fiber optic system in a, in a spaceship? Well, okay, if suddenly everything in the vehicle suddenly becomes mass canceled and even the electrons become mass canceled it means that all of the all of the telemetry that's going through your system is going to go out of haywire it's going to be like suddenly the system goes through a phase change and everything's superconducting why use fiber optics because photons have no mass supposedly so they're unaffected so it means that any information any telemetry that you send back and forth to your computer. It doesn't matter if the computer functions at the superconducting level because it just makes it faster, more efficient, smarter. But you want to be able to control the aircraft so it doesn't crash. What's the best way to do with fiber optics? A second innovation involves the delicate task of monitoring composite surfaces against pressure, stress, strain, and chemical decomposition. 
This is often achieved through a series of bright grating sensors located along lengths of fiber optics which are embedded into composite materials. However, NASA has increased the sensing locations exponentially from what is currently available. Applications for the macrofiber composite are almost limitless. They had a big black curtain that divided the hangar into two, two different areas and that behind these curtains was another big area and inside this area they had um, you know all the lights turned off and they go in they turn the lights on and here are three flying saucers floating off the floor no cables suspended from the ceiling holding them up no landing gear underneath just floating hovering above the floor Deanne did this with United Press International could you please address uh, the vehicle that uh, there was a drawing uh, displayed of why would this vehicle be on display at an air show? We said there were three vehicles. The first one, the smallest one, the one was partially taken apart, the one that was shown in the video that was running in this hangar, November 12, 1988, at Norton Air Force Base, was about 24 feet in diameter at its widest part, right at the base of that flange. In a few instances, I can say there are clearly over-unity electromagnetic devices, things that produce more electrical energy out than in. This is an alien reproduction vehicle, and just to be clear, uh, this means that it is uh, based on advanced anti-gravity and zero-point energy propulsion systems. The next biggest one was 60 feet in diameter at the base. There are corporations such as SAIC, Lockheed Martin, Northrop, and others that deal specifically with advanced energy and propulsion systems connected to UFOs. And I think that what has happened, from, from the best we can tell, is that we have lost control of these projects from a constitutional law perspective because the infrastructure within military intelligence and corporate channels is so well funded. Oh, by the way, in the largest of three vehicles was about 120 to 130 feet. That's, that's massive. Think about it. It's just huge. The reason it's called alien reproduction vehicle is that it's based on the study of extraterrestrial vehicles, but it is manufactured by human uh, military intelligence aerospace contracting arrangements. Brad said that in this exhibit at Norton Air Force Base, that a three-star general said that these vehicles were capable of doing light speed or better. I think he made a mistake at Roswell. Rather than admitting it, they covered it. an object that exists in our immediate space. For years, there have been anomalies recorded, such as mysterious lights, flashes, and objects that have been seen by astronomers here on Earth. NASA released a compilation of these recorded reports prior to the first moon mission. Go ahead. This is Houston. Say again, seven. Right here. Let me call here again. The reference in that conversation was uh, bogus. It was uh, formally reported. Thank you, bogus. And this is Germany Control Houston at uh, 4 hours, 24 minutes into the flight. 
Well, as far as the moon is concerned, I think they found when they got up there that there was already somebody there. And I, I wouldn't want to say any more than that. <laughs> but <laughs> they got out of there and they haven't been back. But I have seen certain documents and um, read certain reports that indicate that there's somebody already there that, that knows a lot more than we do and would uh, you know, be willing to run us off if we didn't go on our own. I doubt that we will go to the moon again. It has been argued that the moon could be used as an indicator of extraterrestrial visits to our solar system. Unfortunately, the detection of ET artifacts on the moon is outside the interests of most mainstream archaeologists, as archaeology tends to... the photo lab in the restricted area, and this was between missions. Uh, one of the gentlemen I had been friends with, and I still talk to occasionally, uh, he pointed to one area of this mosaic. It was one panel of a mosaic and with a smile on his face. He said, look over there. And I looked, and in one of the photo panels, uh, I saw a round white dot. And at the time, it was very crisp, very sharp lines on it. And I said to him, uh, what what is that? Is that a dot on the emulsion? And then he's grinning and he says, uh, dots on the emulsion don't leave round shadows on the ground. And there was a round shadow at the right angle, at the correct angle, the sun shining on the trees. I saw pine trees. I didn't see a coastline. I don't know where this was. And uh, I said, is this a UFO? And he's smiling at me and he says, I can't tell you that. I can't tell you that. What I knew he meant was, it was, but he couldn't tell me. So I said, what are you going to do with this information? And he said, well, we always have to airbrush them out before we sell them to the public. In 1965, um, mm -hmm. in mid-1965, I was loaned to the Lunar Orbiter Project at NASA on Langley Field. They had problems with a piece of uh, electronic equipment that was bottlenecking their production of photographs. 
Um, I was taken into the laboratory where the equipment was malfunctioning. The uh, airman second class was in the dark room at that time. I was also an airman second class. About 30 minutes into the process, he said to me, in a very distressed way, um, by the way, we've discovered a base on the backside of the moon. And then he proceeded to put photographs down in front of me, and clearly in these photographs were structures, spherical buildings, and towers. Always airbrush these out before we sell them to the public. Mosaics and showed showed this base, which had geometric shapes. There were towers. There were uh, spherical uh, buildings. Uh, there were very tall uh, towers and things that looked somewhat like radar dishes, but they were large structures. If I compare it to what I'm seeing now, because I do have photographs that have artifacts in them that are similar to what I saw. They're massive. Some of the structures are, you know, half a mile in, in, in size. So they're, they're huge structures. Uh, some, of the, some of the buildings uh, seem to have uh, very reflective surfaces on them. Uh, some, a couple of structures that I saw reminded me of um, cooling towers at, at uh, power generating plants. They had that sort of a shape. Some of them were, were just very, very straight and tall with a flat top. The particular shot that I saw, there were several clustered together over a landscape, a fairly large landscape. Um, I worked there for three more days, and I remember going home and naively thinking, I can't wait to hear about this on the evening news. And here it is more than 30 years later, and I hope we hear about it tonight. And I will testify under oath before Congress that what I'm saying is the truth. In 1959, the U.S. Army completed a plan for a manned military outpost on the moon. The Horizon Lunar Outpost was said to be necessary to protect United States' interests on the moon, to conduct moon-based surveillance of the Earth and space, to act as a communications relay, and to serve as a base for exploration of the moon. The permanent outpost would cost $6 billion and become operational in December 1966 with 12 soldiers. The base would be defended against Russian overland attack by man-fired weapons. The Apollo program began only two years after the Horizon report, but a moon base would not have been established earlier than the 1970s. During the discussion of UFOs, the question ultimately is going to come up, can any government keep secrets, let alone the U.S. government? 
And the answer to that is unequivocally yes. People in high-level government have very, very little, if any, information, valid information about this. Most have no more knowledge than the man in the street. There's always been what they call the need to know. They keep pretty much each organization an island unto itself. I looked at him and I was pretty startled because I'd worked out there several years and never seen anything like this, never heard of anything like this. I had a top secret crypto clearance and I could go into areas where um, my commanders, some commanders could not even get in. He was a, uh, a civilian but had done a, done a lot of work with NASA on a lot of committees and what have you. And I think his problem was the fact that he hadn't heard about this. They can't get in there because they don't need, have the need to know, even though they have the same clearance as the guy that gets to go in there. He knew that he was very important because he was on a lot of committees in NASA. And since he was very important but hadn't heard about this thing, this couldn't be true. The UFO secrets can be kept secret from other people who have the same security clearance. And the truth is they have hidden things like UFO and extraterrestrial information from us for years. Not just the current era, but back before the 1900s. There's about 38 levels above top secret. The highest is cosmic. That's okay, uh, I'll tell you right up now. That's UFOs, aliens, and particleization. Now, like you heard a while ago, there's only probably about 25 people in the world that know things that are known at that level. No president has had that level, has ever been cleared for that level. Eisenhower was the closest. Eisenhower wanted somebody to be in charge. He tried the CIA director, and uh, it didn't work. CIA was working primarily for itself. Most of the intelligence directors of the service were working for themselves. What happened was Eisenhower got sold out. I think that he realized that all of a sudden this, this, this matter is, is going into, uh, into the control of corporations. He uh, realized that he was losing control. He realized that this, this the phenomenon of, of uh, of whatever it was that uh, that we were faced with uh, was not going to be in the best hands and that that those were the as far as I can remember that was the expression that was used it's not going to be in the best hands in the councils of government we must gar guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence whether sought or unsought by the military industrial complex the potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals. And so it was organized under the name the NRO. You couldn't mention NRO. NRO, National Reconnaissance Office, basically run by the Air Force. The Reconnaissance Office, from my understanding of people that I've had contacts with since I retired, has taken on a lot more responsibility, particularly towards UFO and extraterrestrial activities you could say that they picked up where Blue Book dropped off. If you're on that level, there's an organization worldwide called ACIO, that's Alien Contact Intelligence Organization. If you pay your dues <laughs> and you follow the rules, you can benefit, your government is allowed to benefit from that organization's information. Henry Kissinger uh, headed a, uh, a, some sort of a study group back in the 50s uh, to study the ramifications of this information if it had leaked uh, through a credible source. In fact, uh, Jimmy Carter was not brought into the loop.
they, for some reason, the group, the control group, uh, they, they just, they, they don't trust the guy for some reason. They don't trust Jimmy Carter. They were afraid that he would come out and make statements, uh, blanketed statements to, uh, to the news media. I was contacted by Ms. Marcia Smith, who was the director of the Science and Technology Division of the Congressional Research Service. She uh, asked to meet with me, and I met with her, and she informed me that President Carter, uh, upon taking office in January of 1977, held a meeting with then the director of Central Intelligence, who was George Bush Sr., and demanded that the director of Central Intelligence turn over to the president the classified information about unidentified flying objects and the information that was in the possession of the United States intelligence community concerning the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence. This information was refused to the President of the United States by the Director of Central Intelligence, George Bush Sr. told us we could not talk about this to anyone, including um, any of the, any of He did not want to die, leaving us with these problems. Just hope that the future people such as yourself and me will know what to do with this type of knowledge that this man brought forward. I do say that he is the first man to come forward in a high capacity. Measures have been taken by agencies to terminate people who are who appear to be inconvenient or troublesome through knowing too much. I would go interview people that claimed they had seen something and uh, try to convince them they hadn't seen something or they were, you know, halluc hallucinating or something. Well, if that didn't work, another team would come in and give all the threats and threaten them, their family, and so on and so forth. And they would be in charge of discrediting them, make them look foolish, or so on and so forth. Now, if that didn't work, then there was another team 
that put an end to that problem one way or the other. Secretary of Defense Forstall was the first real powerful known person that was eliminated because he was going to release the information. And nobody has ever paid for that crime. That crime had never been really thoroughly investigated by forces to see what happened to him. But most people know that he was thrown out the window of the hospital and he wasn't killed by being thrown out the window, but he never got up alive. He was talking about being erased. And I said, man, I said, what do you mean, erased? He said, yes. He said, you will be erased. I said, how do you know all this? And there's something to that effect. And, and he said, I know. He said, they'll, uh, he said, they'll go after not only you, he said, they'll go after your family. Those were his words. And they're yelling at me and they're, they're hollering and cursing and anything, you know, and we'll do you and your whole goddamn family. And they're, they're you know, it was, it was basically that for about eight or nine hours. They're just off on their own. Uh, there's no oversight, no control. They just do whatever they want. They don't, I mean, and, and they're evil, man. These people are evil. Basically, it's, it's an oversight group uh, uh, intermingled with the National Security Council and the National Security Planning Group. They, they have full control. They have no congressional oversight whatsoever. Uh, they answer to nobody uh, except for the President of the United States. But they're trying, to, they're trying to push it aside away from the President. When I was a corporate manager of Fairchild Industries in 1974 through 77, I met the late Dr. Werner von Braun in early 74. At that time, von Braun was dying of cancer. But he assured me that he would live a few more years in order to tell me about the game that was being played. That game being the effort to weaponize space. Weapons in space is still a big enigma. Uh, black covert operations have always been uh, trying to do something like that. Von Braun's purpose in life during the last years of his life, his dying years, was to educate the public and decision makers about why space-based weapons are dumb, dangerous, destabilizing, too costly, unnecessary, unworkable, undesirable. The strategy that Werner von Braun taught me was that first the Russians are going to be considered to be the enemy. In fact, when I met him in 74, they were the enemy, the identified enemy. We were told that they had killer satellites. We were told that they were coming to get us and control us, the dirty commies, that whole story. First, the Russians were the enemy against whom we're going to build space-based weapons. Well, the ballistic missile defense system is probably a, um, a pipe dream in the sense that um, if what it's designed for is the, that you know where it's coming from. And when we had Russia, there was a 50-50 chance that you, you knew about where it would be coming from. In 1977, I was at a meeting in Fairchild Industries in a conference room called the War Room. And in that room were a lot of charts on the walls with enemies, identified enemies, names that people had never heard of, names like Saddam Hussein and Gaddafi. But we were talking then about terrorists, the potential terrorists. No one had ever talked about this before, but this was the next stage after the Russians of, against whom we were going to build space-based weapons, these terrorists. They wanted a weapon system they could put in space 
that would stop a ballistic missile. That was the concept. This is 1977, and they were talking about creating a war in the Gulf region when there was $25 billion in the space-based weapons program that yet had not been identified. It wasn't called the Strategic Defense Initiative, at least, until 1983. This weapon system then had obviously been going on for some time that I didn't know anything about. When Star Wars was brought out as an idea, which was before Reagan actually, uh, and incorporated into his administration, it became pretty much a window dressing, as when people would call it. But there was a lot of truth behind what they were trying to do. They knew the basic principle of what they wanted to do. So I stood up in this meeting in 1977, and it said, I'd like to know why we're talking about space-based weapons against these enemies. I'd like to know more about this. Would somebody tell me what this is about? Nobody answered. They went on with this meeting as though I hadn't said anything. We heard a lot about terrorism. Then we were going to identify third world country crazies. We now call them nations of concern. Um, with the rogue nations we have today, it's absolutely ludicrous. But he said that would be the third enemy against whom we would be needing to build space-based weapons. And the next enemy was asteroids. Now at this point, he kind of chuckled the first time he said it. Asteroids against asteroids were going to build space-based weapons. So it was funny then. And the funniest one of all was against what he called aliens, extraterrestrials. That would be the final card. And over and over and over during the four years that I knew him and was giving his speeches for him, he would bring up that last card. And remember, Carol, the last card is the alien card. We're going to have to build space-based weapons against aliens. And all of it, he said, is a lie. Well, if they were hostile, uh, I, my own knowledge is, uh, and, and feeling, I don't know about all of them, is that we could have been, uh, with their weaponry as it might be used, uh, could have destroyed us a long time ago. If beings can travel in time space, then anything we would put in orbit as a weapon would be like, like going against Genghis Khan with a firecracker. Now, some would like for us to believe and like to develop the idea that the aliens and people are our enemy now, but that's not true. I noticed the satellite's positioning. I said, now, this is supposed to be a system that tracks radar anomalies on Earth, right? You know, the whole thing, the movement. Yep, that's what it does. And I says, and why are half of them pointing towards the outer space? Towards the moon, towards areas that are just blank space. I have concluded that I'm fighting against the clock. That I have but a short time to try to convince people that we are moving in an avenue where we are going to militarize space. As a result of militarizing space, we are going to acquire new technology. We're going to evolve new technology. At least half of those satellites you got up there aren't looking at Earth. He had to receive several transmissions from the Pentagon and from other uh, satellite uh, monitoring stations of the NSA that they were tracking uh, ETVs, extraterrestrial, that stands for extraterrestrial uh, vehicles. I said, what are they looking for? He says, well, you got to have me to know, know about that. We put nuclear weapons out in space as a line of defense, and we was ready to blow them up if they started in. He didn't mention a timeline.
that's going to lead us into interstellar travel. As a direct result, we will become a threat to them unless we spiritually grow also. Air Force Space Command, Masters of Space. June 9, 2006. Air Force Space Command was crucial in Zarqawi hit. Air Force Space Command news release. Air Force Space Command delivered space combat effects for the precision strike that resulted in the death of terrorist leader Abu Musam al-Zarqawi, head of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. A global positioning system aided GBU-38 Joint Direct Attack Munition was one of the two munitions used in the bombing of Zarqawi's last safe house. An artist concept shows a GPS satellite orbiting Earth. We have to credit Lockheed Martin for this one, folks. Once again, GPS-aided munitions played a significant role in the success of an important operation, said Brigadier General Donald Alston, Director of Air and Space Operations, or AFSPC. We provide communications, navigation and timing, intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance, and missile warning. Our mission is 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week providing space attacks to the warfighter, said Vice Commander Major General Thomas Taverney. Air Force Space Command, Masters of Space. President George Bush is expected to issue a directive in the next few weeks giving the U.S. Air Force a green light for the development of space weapons, potentially triggering a new global arms race, it was reported yesterday. The new weapons being studied range from hunter-killer satellites to orbiting weapons using lasers, radio waves, or even dense metal tubes dropped from space by a weapon known as Rods from God on ground targets. Space warfare experts said they expected the Bush administration directive to signal a shift in attitude towards exploring ways of affirming U.S. dominance in space militarily. In a memo that I wrote to President Bush last week, I stated that this campaign will persist until our goals are met, and they are as follows. That we have open, honest hearings on the subject in the U.S. Congress. That there would be a permanent ban on the weaponization of space or the targeting of any objects of extraterrestrial origin. That there be a full and complete study of classified technologies connected to this subject, specifically technologies connected to UFO and extraterrestrial vehicles, yet declassified and used for peaceful energy generation and propulsion, would solve the looming energy crisis definitively. You don't need cars unless you've got an internal combustion engine. Well, if you have one of these units, you know, that's about 16 inches long and about 8 inches high and about 10 inches wide, then you don't need to plug into Kit Carson, the local electric company. It burns nothing, no pollution, okay? It never wears out because there's no moving parts. Vinny Klein uses an alternative fuel source once thought impossible. He says people still have trouble believing him when he reveals his liquid fuel. Water. Take water and electricity, and we break it down through our uh, very unique electrolysis process. Klein has just patented his process of converting H2O to HHO, producing a gas that combines the atomic power of hydrogen with the chemical stability of water. It turns right back to water. You see the water running off of this. Klein originally designed his water-burning engine for cutting metal. He thought his invention would replace volatile acetylene in welding factories. And then one day, as he drove to his laboratory in Clearwater, he thought of another way to burn his HHO gas. On a 100-mile trip, uh, we use about four ounces of water. Klein says his prototype 1994 Ford Escort can travel exclusively on water, though he currently has it rigged to run as a water and gasoline hybrid. Simply sp uh, speaking, it can change the world by reducing our dependence on fossil fuels. These are equivalent to our... Uh... Pete Dominici is helping Klein take his hydrogen technology patents from a two-room office in Clearwater to consumer markets around the world. You know what? Microsoft came out of nowhere, came out of the garage. Why not hydrogen technologies? The duo is already in negotiations with one U.S. automaker and the U.S. government. Their plans have grown from basic welding with water to powering the entire world from the safest 
and cleanest fuel on Earth. Members of Congress recently invited Denny Klein to Washington to demonstrate his technology. Now his company is currently developing a Hummer for the U.S. military that can run on both water and gasoline. I have concluded that it's based on a few people making a lot of money and gaining power. We have cartels. We have a whole set of cartels in an area, interlocking corporations, and behind this, we have a few people who are quite wealthy and who own most things. It's about ego. Everybody's trying to be the big monkey. It's really as simple as that. Who's control of patrolling the world? A lot of the people think that Iraq, Iran, and so on and so forth. They don't. They don't. We control it. Us and the British interests and the world, the world interests. Well, some people refer to this the secret government. I would say that in terms of profiting from the status quo, I mean, you know, big oil. Uh, there are certain geopolitical and financial infrastructures uh, that would uh, not welcome a, a definitive replacement to the fossil fuels. So what we get is the great Armageddon everybody's been dreading. The energy crisis going right now, in my view, will probably evoke a great Armageddon that we've all feared so long in about 2007. It's about a few people who really are playing an old, dangerous, costly game for their own pocketbooks and power struggle. People in power right now don't want us to know is that this free energy is available to everybody. We can tell, I will tell you, and we can prove this with other scientists who are ready to come forward, that we already have a complete replacement for any fossil fuels or ionizing nuclear power plants. We don't need them, we haven't needed them, probably have not needed them since the time I was born. The quote cover up of this issue that has been going on for the last 50 years is probably the biggest single threat to our democratic society. This is the greatest strategic threat to survival of the United States and in fact of civilization itself. It still bothers me that uh, that uh, I've seen all this, I know all this, and like I, I'm, I'm walking around like with the answer and nobody wants to ask the question. I think it's time for us to, to act to, to end this charade. It's definitely time to, to make a uh, dis disclosure on this. It's uh, been kept secret too long. One of the things that I'm upset about is that good people are forced to do illegal things. And I believe that this information should be given to the American public. It's the discovery of the, of, the, of, of the lifetime of humankind, isn't it? To find out that we're not here alone. People are walking around in a daze. They have no idea, no idea what is going on. The fools may blow the world from other causes. Don't misunderstand me. But they're going to blow it from this cause. A shadowy government with its own air force his own Navy, his own fundraising mechanism, and the ability to pursue his own ideas of the national interest, free from all checks and balances, and free from the law itself. Whatever activity is going on, to the extent that it is a clandestine group, a quasi-government group, a uh, quasi-private group, it is without any type as far as I can tell, of high-level government oversight. And that is a great concern. We have contact with aliens not originating from some foreign country, but from some other solar system. And I have been a party to them.